Father, as we come together today, we just ask your blessing upon this place, on this time, recognizing what power you have in our lives, what power you have in our midst, what power you have in this world. Father, in this place, in this time, may we set aside whatever it was that distracted us before we came in. Will we put aside whatever calamities may be happening in our world outside of this place, but in this place, in this time, may we focus on you. May we focus on who you are and what you have for us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray all of this. Amen. All right, kids, you guys are dismissed to Children's Church at this time. Well, over the last several weeks, actually going all the way back into October, we've been on this journey of walking through the Bible in chronological order. And we have, we have seen times where we spent uh, an entire week on four or five chapters of a book uh, when we were in the times of, of Noah and in the times of Abraham and Adam and all of these different characters in the Old Testament. But then in the last few weeks, we went through these time frames where, where in one Sunday we would cover as much as 17 books of the Bible. And we did that because we're, we're approaching it from a chronological standpoint. And so when we do that, we, it's, it's again remembering that, that during the time of Second Kings, we also had so many other books. That's where all of the prophets are speaking, uh, save three of them. Uh, and, and then last week we ended that up with uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, as well as Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And so in doing so, when the book of Malachi ends, it's just about 400 years prior to Jesus walking the earth. And so we have this time frame, and, and I actually, uh, when, when I started out this series, I thought, well, this week, this Sunday, we're going to jump straight over into God breaking the silence and looking at uh, the, the angels that show up to Mary and, and to uh, Elizabeth and the angels that show up uh, and, and announce the birth of the king. And, and something happened over the last three or four weeks, and it, it just reminded me that we actually need to talk a little bit and experience the 400 years of silence that the Israelites went through. And so uh, in that, uh, I just kind of want to start by, um, Ms. Susan, do we have the, the sermon or is that like completely not working this morning? Okay, she's working on it. Um, I, again, like I said, I had to go retype all of my sermon notes this morning. And so Ms. Susan uh, got it late. And so any delay is not her fault but mine. But uh, this is kind of where we'll, we'll, we'll start. Um, there was this study that was done about 10 years ago that kind of went through and asked children ages 4 to 8 to describe what does love mean. And so Rebecca, age 8, says, When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over to paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. I'm hearing a collective, aww, across the room. Um, uh, Emily, also age eight, says, love is when you kiss all the time. Then, when you get tired of kissing, you still want to be together and you talk more. My mommy and daddy are like that. They look gross when they kiss. Uh, <laughs> our kids hide their eyes. They, <laughs> they don't want to see that at all. Bobby, age seven, says, love is what's in the room when you at Chris, with you at Christmas, if you stop opening presents and listen. That's pretty deep for a seven-year-old. Nika, age six, says, if you want to learn more, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. Now that is a preachable sermon right there. Noel says, love is when you tell a guy that you like his shirt and he wears it every day. Tommy, age six, says, love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. Mary Ann, age four, puts it this way, and this is exactly how Aiden would say it, my, my nine-year-old. 
Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left them alone all day. This one, I wish, I wish adults thought more about this. Lauren, age four, says, I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her clothes and has to go out and buy new ones for herself. I'm going to skip that one. Um, Lucas, age six, and this is the last one of these. He says this, Mrs. White next door died a few weeks ago, and I saw Mr. White out on the porch crying because he missed her. I went over, climbed up in his lap to help him cry. Love. So, so where, does, where does this conversation of what does love mean, where does that enter into this conversation of silence? Because here's the reality. Silence for 400 years is only endurable if you know that you are loved. Silence for four days in our lives are only endurable if we know that we are loved. Because love brings faith. Faith brings hope. And hope allows us to endure those times where God just is not speaking to us. And so I looked up, I looked up throughout, uh, throughout the internet, you know, the internet's a great place to go if you just got weird questions that you want to know the answer to. And so I asked this question of, you know, Captain Google. I said, why do women stay silent in a relationship? And so here's the top seven. Either they are in deep thought. Women, can you identify with that? If you're in deep thought, maybe you'll be quiet with your, with your loved one. Maybe you've had enough. <laughs> That's a reason to be quiet. Um, maybe you're content and you just want to enjoy the contentment. Uh, maybe it's just not worth the effort to explain what they're doing wrong. Um, <laughs> I love this one in there. They either need to eat or fast. If a woman's hungry or wants to fast, they might be quiet. Maybe they're heartbroken or maybe they're just savoring the moment. Now, that, that, that is actually a little bit different than asking why do men stay quiet in a relationship. <laughs> they are either frustrated, um, they just want to be affectionate, um, read between the lines on that one, uh, nervous about their response. <laughs> they are, they're, they're afraid that their conversation will be painful. Uh, they feel outwitted or that they cannot win. That's a very common one. Um, or men just aren't supposed to talk. You know, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of typically why men stay quiet in a relationship. Uh, and so if we take those and we ask ourselves, so if we got 400 years of silence from God, do any of those translate to why God would be silent? And so uh, it, do you think God is just in deep thought? Well, he kind of knows everything, so there's no reason for him to truly ponder, you know, the existence of life. Because he's just had enough. You know, I'm not going to say that he can't. <laughs> but again, if God is omniscient and omnipresent, he already kind of knows what's going to happen. So is he frustrated where he's just like, oh, I'm not talking to them. You know, and I don't think he is. Um, could it be that he's content? You know, we, from the scriptures of Bible that we've been reading for a long time, there seems to be very, very short periods of contentment in God's existence with the way that humankind treats him. Um, <laughs> it's just not worth the effort to explain. I don't think that's God at all. I think God always takes the effort. Um, I don't think he needs to eat or fast. I don't think it's because he's heartbroken, again, because he already knows what's going to happen. Um, but I think it's possible that he is savoring a moment. <sighs> Look what they're doing. Look how they're loving. You know, if we take that to the same points of, of God and, and apply that to those reasons men are silent, are they frustrated, affectionate? Are they nervous about their response? Are they, are, are they afraid that the conversation is painful? That's the one that I think may have a little merit to it, that God may be quiet if the conversation is going to be painful. I don't think they feel outwitted or that they cannot win, and I don't think that God feels like he's just not supposed to speak. But when it comes down to it, this is why I believe God is silent. Out of God's love, 
He always wants his timing to be right. Out of God's love, he always wants his timing to be right. Um, in, in looking around this week, I came across this, uh, this blogger. Um, her name is Lori Ennis, and she is uh, a wife of a military man. Um, and her story is that she's had to move quite a bit. She's had to move, be around uh, a lot of different places as her husband gets restationed. But the biggest part of her story is that uh, about four years ago, when, when she and her husband were expecting their first child, they found out they were going to be having twins. And two weeks before the due date, she went to the doctor for a regular visit and there was no heartbeat on either child. And, and so her question in this particular blog is, is, how can people say God is good? And this is a Christian woman. How can people say God is good? And so her, her contention within this is so often that we attribute God's goodness to something really cool that happens in our lives. I got a new parking space. God is good. You know, I got a raise on my job. God is good. We had an awesome uh, birthday party. God is good. Trey was a phenomenal preacher this morning. God is good. <laughs> See, y'all are getting way better at this. <laughs> but, but, you know, that we often attribute it to those kind of deals. But then, what do we do if that is always the truth? I'm sorry you lost your job, but God is good. Well, that's kind of a hard place to hear that. I'm sorry that I get to take my child home in a car seat and you have to take yours home in a coffin. But God is good. And so the problem is that she sees with it is that God, it's not that God is or isn't good. It's how God is good is the, is the thing that we really need to focus on. God is good because even when you take your children home in a coffin, he cries with you. God is good because even in the worst parts of your life, he has never let you go. Even in those moments of silence when there is nothing redeemable about what's going on in your life, God still never lets go. God is good because no matter your situation, he is still there. To me, one of the greatest stories to illustrate that fact came in the, in the form of a, a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford was a successful lawyer and businessman in Chicago with a loving wife, uh, with a loving family, his wife Anna and five children. However, they were not strangers to tears and tragedy. Their young son died with pneumonia in 1871. And in the same year, much of their business was lost to the great Chicago fire. Yet God in his mercy and kindness allowed the business to flourish once more. On November 21st, 1873, the French ocean liner, Ville de Havre, however you say that, was crossing the Atlantic from the U.S. to Europe with 313 passengers on board. Among the passengers were Mrs. Spafford and their four daughters. Although Mr. Spafford had planned to go with his family, he found it necessary to stay in Chicago to help solve an unexpected business problem. He told his wife he would join her and their children in Europe a few days later. His plan was to take another ship. About four days into crossing of the Atlantic, the ship collided with a powerful, iron-hulled Scottish ship, the Loch Urn. Suddenly, all of those on board were in grave danger. Anna hurriedly brought her four children to the deck. She knelt there with Annie, Margaret Lee, Bessie, and Tennant, and prayed that God would spare them if that could be his will, or to make them willing to endure whatever awaits them. Within approximately 12 minutes, the ship slip, slipped beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic, carrying with it 226 of the passengers, including all four of the Spafford children. A sailor rowing a small boat over the spot where the ship went down spotted a woman floating on a piece of the wreckage. It was Anna, still alive. He pulled her into the boat, and, there, uh, and they were picked up by another large vessel 
Uh, and nine, la- nine days later, they landed in Cardiff, Wales. From there, she wired her husband with this message, which began, Saved alone, what shall I do? Mr. Spafford later framed the telegram and placed it in his office. Another of the ship's survivors, Pastor Weiss, later recalled Anna saying, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. Mr. Spafford booked passage on the next available ship and left to join his grieving wife. With the ship about four days out, the captain called Spafford to his cabin and told him they were over the place where his children went down. And according to a daughter of Spafford's who was born after this accident, it is in that place at that time that he sat down with his journal and he penned these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. How can anyone sit in that space in that moment and still trust God? How can anyone in 400 years of silence in Jerusalem still trust God? How can, how can Miss Ennis, after losing her two preborn children, stand up and have faith in God? And it is because God has promised us that in his time, he will reveal himself. Now, here's something that's very important for all of us to know. I think sometimes God doesn't answer our question of why because there is no answer that will give us peace. Why did I lose that job? there's probably not an answer that's going to let me love him more. Why did I lose my child? There is not an answer to that question on this side of heaven that's going to let us love him more. Why did this happen or this happen or this happen? There are times in our lives where we are not prepared for the answer because the truth of the matter is in our grief, there is no response that God could give us that will help us to understand who he is. Because we see this much. This is our entire focus. This much. This little space. But we have no idea what this little space, how it impacts the rest of the country, the rest of the world, the rest of eternity. We can't know. We can't know what that looks like. And so it's hard for us to wrap our brains who have intentionally been wired to not fully understand all of eternity. It is by God's grace that there are times we don't get the answer to our question of why. Now that is not easy. But that comes because we can read scripture and we can understand that God has a plan. Over and over again in scripture, starting in the Old Testament, in Habakkuk 2, 3, it says, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Ecclesiastes 8, 6, For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's troubles lie heavy on him. Acts 1, 7, He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Psalm 31, 15, My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Romans 5, 6, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And John 13, 7, Jesus answered them, what am I doing, what what am I doing that you do, man, my typing is horrible, guys, I'm sorry. 
He says, what I'm doing now, you will not understand, but afterwards you will. So the question is, as we come to it in this place of this service, to this morning I want to give us an opportunity to do something different, something unique, something that I hope will help everyone in this room. You see, what I learned over the last few weeks as I walked around and I talked to you guys, and the reason that I chose to not skip over the 400 years of silence, even though there are no scriptures written about this time, Right? I don't have scripture reference to talk to you about the 400 years of silence, but the lack thereof. And so in that, what I, when I moved around and I spoke to you guys over the last several weeks, I feel, found out that there are several of you, while you may not use the terminology, there are several of us in this room who are in that time of silence. God, I need you to speak to me. God, I need your direction. God, I don't know what to do about this, or I don't know what to do about that. And the reality is, is everyone in this room probably has at least one thing in their life where they are begging for God to give them an answer. And for whatever reason, this is a moment of silence for you. Now, there are others in this room who right now, God is speaking heartily. And so for you, that doesn't mean that this sermon is not for you, that this time is not for you. Because the truth of the matter is, if you are in a time of plenty, God gives you those times of plenty so you can serve and encourage and love those who are in times of less. And so what I did this week and what I want to give us some time to do is, uh, in a few moments, Sister Susan is going to play just some music in the background, just something to kind of fill the time and and. Um, our ushers are going to come and they're going to have these greeting cards and they're going to have pens if you need a pen but what I want to ask you to do is if you are in a moment of silence then I'm going to ask you to take and write a letter to God it doesn't have to be long just a short letter just something within this greeting card something that you want to give to God God right now I need whatever that is if you need time to scream and yell at him, if you need time to gripe and complain to him, if you need time to beckon and beg of him, this is okay. I have learned over my years, one of my, one of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Lamentations, and one of my favorite segments outside of Lamentations comes in, Isaiah, in, in Jeremiah chapter 20. If you don't think God can handle your crying, I encourage you to read those. Daniel chapter 20, uh, verse 9 is actually my favorite. Uh, Jeremiah takes this time to complain to God. He is so angry at God for asking him to do stuff and yet not giving him a way to see the answers to those prayers that he actually stops and he says, not only, God, do I wish I had never been born, I wish the guy that announced the birth to my dad had never been born. Now, have you ever been that angry? And Jeremiah, at the end of that, comes back in, in verse 9 and says, But, O oh God, if I were to try to keep inside all that you have blessed me with, I would burn from the inside out. And so I, I, I want you to understand those to say that if this morning you need, you need to, to scream and rant at God on paper, you have that freedom. God is big enough to hear your gripes. God is big enough to hear your complaints. God is big enough to hear your prayers, okay? And so for you this morning, if you were in that place and you want to write a letter to God, then I'll invite you to do one of two things during this time of, of, of song in the background. I want you to write what's on your heart. I want you to come up and I want you to lay that on the altar. Now, if it is something that you are okay with me, Pastor Trey, reading so that I can pray for you better, leave that envelope unsealed. And I'll take it out. I won't show anybody else. I won't talk to anybody else about it or just between me and you and God. And I will pray specifically for whatever that is. But maybe you have something that you think, I don't want nobody reading this. That's okay too. Lick the envelope, seal it shut, lay it on the altar, and I will pray for it as a sealed prayer. It's just between you and God at that point in time, but I will be praying for you. But maybe this morning... You're on the other side of that, and you think, man, God is just speaking to me right now. Well, then I'm going to ask you to take a greeting card or two, and I'm going to ask you to write letters of encouragement on it. 
letters of encouragement to maybe the people you see here in the congregation today. Maybe it's to someone who you don't see. Maybe it's someone that we don't even know, but you want to write them a letter. Great, do that. Send it to them, mail it to them, give it to them personally. If it's to someone in this church and you want to stay anonymous about who it's coming from, that's okay. Write their name on the front of it, lay it on the back, uh, back table back there. We will put it in the mail this week for you, and you will be completely anonymous in how you bless someone, but you will have that opportunity to bless them. And so, does that make everything clear of what I'm asking right now? Everybody, everybody know? Shakes their heads? Shakes their heads? All right. So I'm, I'm asking everyone to take at least one card, but if you need three of them, I, print, I printed plenty of them. Uh, the ushers are coming and bringing those around. Um, I want to say a prayer for you. Miss Susan's going to hit play on this, and we're going to give you guys about 10 minutes. During this time, though, as you're writing, as you're listening, maybe you want to sing with what's there, um, we want to give you the opportunity to, as you come forward and lay things on the altar or hand things out, we want you to have the opportunity to come and take communion this morning. And so during this same 10-minute time frame that we're doing this, if as you finish, you think, God, I want to I dedicate this time to you, up here are the elements of offering. There is the, the blood of Christ that was poured out for you, the body that was broken for you, and we would invite you to come and take the communion elements during this same time as a way to worship and connect with God. So let me pray, and then we're going to dive into this, this time of altar response, communion, prayer, writing letters, encouraging people, giving it over to God thing. Is that cool? All right. Father, we give you this space. We give you this time. We give you our hearts, our energies, our all. Father, I lift up those who are in times of silence right now. I am praying that this morning they would hear from you as they write these letters out, as they cast them before you, that in that, God, they are able to release and know that your timing will still be perfect. Father, I pray that out of that, they are allowed to let go of the anxiety of waiting. Father, for those of us who have been given voice here recently, Father, I pray that out of that that excess of love and encouragement that you have given us, that we will be able to think of people who need to hear that same encouraging word, that same love, and that we will be, we will be nudged in the right direction to share that with someone. And Father, for those who want to come and share in the communion and, sa- and, and celebrate the sacrifice that you gave for us, this sacrifice that lets us know that, that you loved us from the beginning, so much so that you were willing to take the place of every sin, the place of every hurt, the place of every heartache, and that you were willing to take those sins and bury them in hell and leave them there. And Father, in this time, may we honor you, may we worship you, may we praise you well. Amen. Well, I pray that this morning you've had an opportunity to connect with God. I pray that perhaps you've had a, a unique opportunity that maybe you haven't had in a while. And I don't want to stop anyone if they're still writing. I don't want to stop anyone if they haven't taken communion yet and want to come do that. But I wanted to, to, to go ahead and, and say a closing prayer. And Brother Kenny is going to come up and he's going to share with you a few things that are going on. But if you're still writing, if you're still praying... I'm going to ask that when Brother Kenny lets everyone go, that we all make a point to be silent until we get to the doors, just to give anyone that may still want to hang around and write or, or, or anything else, I want to give them that time, that space. Um, but I thank you. I thank you. I'm, I'm encouraged. 
by the response. I'm encouraged by, by you guys stopping and just talking to God. So I want to pray for you, and then Brother Kenny's going to come up. And like I said, I just ask that when he's done, that if you guys will just, just be aware that people may still be writing. And so just try to stay quiet till you get to the back of the sanctuary. God, for those who are not hearing you right now, I pray for the peace of your spirit. For those who are hearing and ready to speak on your behalf, that you will give them wisdom of the time and the place to speak, and you will fill their words with you, with your words. And so, Father, as we take from this place, as we, as we go out, I just pray that we take heaven with us, that for every person we come in contact with, that they will know that we are your children because of the love that we show, because of the, the grace that we offer, because of the words of peace that we carry. Through that, may people know that we are yours and you are ours. In the name of Christ, our Lord, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Kenny. Several announcements to share with you this week. The elders will uh, meet this Tuesday here at the church at 6 o'clock. Uh, Wednesday, we'll have our normal services. Thursday, the young and married group will meet here at the church at 6 o'clock, I believe.